see if there are some people outside and then we can see. Okay, hey, so good morning, everyone, here in Corfu and online, and good morning, Nico. And so, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, of course, it's nine nine o five in the morning, so I believe it's time to start. And so, it's a great pleasure to have Nico here today as a as a first speaker, at least online. Next time, hopefully, again in presence. And the talk, the title of his talk is Random Geometry and Naturalness. And you have 35 minutes, 35 plus five minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation. Unfortunately, this time I'm participating online, but I hope uh, we can see each other in person next time. So. So this is the plan of my talk. And uh, the first three parts are kind of reviews on naturalness, baby universe, and two-dimensional gravity. And then I will discuss baby universes in two-dimensional gravity and four-dimensional Lorentzian gravity. And if I have some time left, I would like to also discuss about uh, applications to phenomenology. So what is naturalness? So suppose the, the underlying fundamental theory such as string theory has a momentum scale ms and coupling constant gs. Then by dimensional analysis and the power counting of the couplings, the parameters of the low energy effective theory are given like this. So dimension minus two parameter is Newton constant and that is gs square over ms square. And dimension zero, parameters are gauge and Higgs coupling, and they are proportional to GS. And dimension two parameter is uh, Higgs mass. And this one, if we set it to zero at a tree level, then from one loop, we have uh, something like this. But the problem is uh, this quantity is very large compared to the experimental value. So this is unnatural. And also for dimension four parameter is vacuum energy or cosmological constant. Now again, even if we set to zero at a tree level, from one loop we have uh, this kind of quantity. And then all oh, this is uh, much larger than the experimental value. So cosmological constant is very unnatural. So real values of the cosmological constant and Higgs mass are very unnatural. So therefore, if nature is described by a fundamental theory with a definite momentum scale, such as string theory, the theory should do fine tunings by itself. And one possible mechanism was, was proposed by Coleman based on baby universe. So uh, as he did, uh, let's start with Euclidean path integral that involves the summation over topologies. And consider the low energy effective theory obtained after integrating out the short distance configurations. The among short distance configurations, there should be a space-time wormhole-like configuration in which a thin tube connects two points on the space-time. Here, the two points may belong to either the same universe or different universes. And if we Look, this kind of wormhole-like configuration from the side of the large universes, it looks like two small punctures. But the effect of making a small puncture is equivalent to an insertion of local operators. 
Furthermore, if we in integrate over the gauge field and the metric on the tu tube, each operator is projected to a gauge invariant scale operator. Therefore, a one hole contribution, a one hole contributes to the path integral like this. So here SI is the action constructed from a gauge invariant scalar local operator, such as one R, R mu nu square, Y F mu nu square, and so on and so forth. And CIJ are numbers that are determined by the path integral over the tube and expected to be of order one in the Planck unit. So if we sum over the number of wormholes, the contribution is exponentiated and we have a quadratic form of local actions. And furthermore, uh, if we take account of bifurcated wormholes like this, we obtain cubic forms of local actions and of quotic forms and so on and so forth. Thus, we have seen the low energy effective theory of quantum gravity that involves topology change is given by a power series of local action like this. And here the coefficients ci, cij, and so on are constants of order one in the Planck unit. And regarding S effective as a function of SIs, we can consider the Laplace transform like this. So exponential minus S can be expressed like this. And here lambda one, lambda two, they are just uh, parameters and they are not functional. They are just parameters. And then the path integral for the effective action becomes like this after interchanging the order of integration over phi and integration over lambda. But this part is nothing but a path integral for a local action where lambda i's are coupling constant of the action. So coupling constants are not merely constants, but should be integrated with some weight, w. And in this picture, uh, multiverse appears very natural. So in fact, even if we start from a connected universe, we have disconnected universes after integrating out the short distance fluctuations like this. So this is connected universe, but after integrating, or we have disconnected universe. Therefore, we have to sum over the number of universes in the evaluation of the partition function. So, so the partition function, in the partition function, we have a n or single universes, and the contributions from single universes are exponentiated like this. So here the single lambda is the partition function for a single universe. So we have seen that the partition function is given by averaging this kind of form with some weight w. And this somewhat contradicts with our experience. In fact, we usually recognize coupling constant as just constant and we never observe a superposition of different coupling constant. However, the problem is resolved if Z lambda has a sharp peak around some value lambda around lambda Z. In this case, we can say that nature itself tunes the parameters to lambda Z. An interesting point of this scenario is that W lambda is not important as far as it is a smooth function of lambda. So if we, it is true, the so-called big fix occurs. All the couplings of the low energy effective theory are fixed by themselves, and we do not need precise information about the short distance physics. So here, let's remember what Coleman did, uh, although uh, it is not correct. So for simplicity, we keep only the cosmological constant, lambda. If the universe is large, 
So this single lambda is evaluated by considering S4 geometry classically. So the thing rule is uh, originally given by this path integral, but if universe is large enough, we can appro approximate it by classical solution. Here, R is a radius of S4. Then the, the first term, einstein hilbert term becomes minus R square, and the cosmological constant term becomes R to the fourth. So as a function of R, uh, S looks like this. And uh, so if lambda is positive, uh, the value here is very negatively large. So th this part is very large. Actually, it is proportional to one over lambda. And if lambda is negative, there is no solution. So therefore, in the integral uh, with this weight, the region around lambda equals zero dominates because of this really big. It is irrespectively of W lambda. So this is a point. However, there is a serious problem about the weak rotation for gravity. So for example, let's consider our Euler Dewitt equation. And here H total is a sum of H universe plus H matter plus H gravitons and so on and so forth. And the point is uh, H universe is, has a long sum. Here A is the radius of the universe and uh, this has a negative sum. So this system doesn't have any ground state. And actually weak rotation is not well defined because H matter and H gravitons and these things are bounded from below. So in the complex T variable, the weak rotation can be done in this direction. But uh, H universe is bounded from above. So in order to do weak rotation, we have to rotate the time axis in this direction. So actually we, what we have calculated is a long time version of the tunneling probability. Because uh, in the ordinary uh, Euclidean gravity, we rotate the axis in this direction. So this is a wrong direction for the evolution of the universe itself. And actually this is a long time version of the tunneling probability with which universe pops out from nothing through the potential barrier. So, so, so this sign is the right sign, and this uh, gives a suppression corresponding to the tunnel. So therefore, gravity in four dimensions should be described in Lorentzian signature, while Euclidean gravity makes sense in two dimensions. So in the following, we examine the validity of the baby universe scenario in two-dimensional gravity, and then we consider four-dimensional gravity with Lorentzian signature. So before that, I would like to briefly summarize our two-dimensional gravity. So we consider two-dimensional closed orientable manifold M and introduce the metric field G mu nu and the conformal field with central charge C on M. We then consider the partition function of this system with the total volume of the manifold fixed to A. So here ZM is the partition function of the matter field for the background metric G mu nu. Then we can show that this quantity ZA behaves like this. And here B is a function of C and chi is the Euler number of the surface. And lambda zero is a regularization dependent number that can be absorbed to the renormalization of the cosmological constant. And this function B behaves like this. So if C is greater than one, this one becomes complex. So, and this phenomenon can be understood as an instability of the space time against the formation of pinches. And in other words, if C is greater than one, the space time has infinitely many pinches and takes the shape of a branch polymer. And then I would like to introduce a proper time Hamiltonian for two-dimensional gravity. So we consider a sufficiently large uh, space time for two-dimensional pure gravity. So take an arbitrary point P and consider the set of point VPD 
whose geodesic distances from P are less than or equal to D. So D is, uh, so V, PD is this, this region. And let SPD be the boundary of VPD. So this is S. But then SPD consists of some number of groups with various ranks like this. So we want to examine how SPD changes with D. And in general, the loops contained in SPD splits or merge as D is increased. In order to describe such processes, it is convenient to consider the creation and annihilation operators of groups. So let Psi dagger L and Psi L be the creation and annihilation operators of a loop with length L. And to be precise, Psi dagger L create, creates a loop with one marked point and Psi L annihilates a loop with no marked point. Then or if we consider this kind of state, zero and Psi dagger L1, Psi dagger L k, represent the state with k loops with lengths L1 and L k. So SPD can be expressed as a superposition of such states like this. Okay, so this one with some coefficient and integral and summation. And the devolution of SPD is described by the following equation. So it, it looks like a Schrodinger equation, and this looks like Hamiltonian. And the three terms in H uh, represent the effects of fast splitting of loop with length L1 plus L2 to two loops. And second, uh, merging of two loops with length L1 and L2. And finally, disappearing of a loop with length zero. So note here that the linear term consists of only annihilation operator and not creation operator. Then we can check that this formulation indeed describes the <coughs> two-dimensional pure gravity <coughs> by an explicit calculation. For example, the loop amplitudes are given by this expression. So here, uh, all loops disappear after sufficient proper time. So after sufficient proper time, we have them. So with this uh, preparation, uh, we can consider a uh, baby universe uh, in two dimensions. So for simplicity, let's consider <coughs> Euclidean two-dimensional gravity coupled to a conformal matter with C less than one. And as we have seen, uh, ZA is given by this expression. And here, B is greater than two if C is less than one. So consider the number of random surfaces with a baby universe. So here we consider number of random spheres with area A with a thin tube. So random sphere is a chi equal two. So the number of random surfaces is proportional to A to minus B minus one. And since, since we have two thin tubes, so we have two points, so A to just two. So the, Total, in total, we have a to minus b to one, b plus one. On the other hand, if we consider random tori uh, with area a, so tori is chi equals zero, so this is just a to minus one. So if b is greater than two, so this one is much larger than this. So if we look at them in the time slice, this means that the probability of having a large circle plus small circle is much less than that of two large circles. So therefore, in the simple two-dimensional gravity, the effect of baby universes is much smaller than that of large universes. So Coleman's mechanism does not work. However, as we will see later, in four-dimensional gravity, this is not a serious problem because the probability that a macroscopic universe splits into two macroscopic macroscopic universes is highly suppressed. So it is meaningful to try to make a model in which the effect of the baby universe can be regarded as a correction to the mother universe like this. 
So actually, it can be realized if we introduce an additional factor for each wormhole to cancel the weight coming from the hand of GS square. So however, there appears another difficulty. If we sum up the wormholes, we have a uh, exponential a squared because each wormhole has a squared factor. And the summation over a does not convert for any cosmological constant. Well, formally, it is possible to define a matrix model with a double trace term and define the partition function by an analytic continuation. But it turns out that very to be very artificial. So if we want to use a two-dimensional theory as a model of four-dimensional theory, it is better to switch to the Lorentzian series. So let's try to construct a multipath Hamiltonian of two-dimensional Lorentzian gravity. And as we have seen, Euclidean multipath of two-dimensional pure gravity is described by this Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian was originally obtained from the dynamical triangulation. However, it can also be derived in the temporal gauge, except for the tadpole term. So we guess what define the Lorentzian Hamiltonian by modifying H to become permission. So by introducing tadpole of psi dagger in addition to psi and redefining L psi L as psi L, we obtain what this Hamilton. And in the case of Euclidean proper time Hamiltonian, the cho choice of rho L corresponds to two-dimensional gravity coupled to various minimal conformal fields of PQ type, where P is two. Rho is a coefficient of the time. So for, ex for example, if we or take this one, we have pure gravity. So two, three conformal field is nothing. And, but if we take this, we have a topological gravity. And if we take this thing, we have a jerky for tidal volume gravity. So however, in the case of Lorentzian gravity, we do not know the theory precisely. So here we assume the following form to make a simple model. Here, rho tilde is a Laplace transform of rho. And actually, if we take this rho, this rho can be eliminated by the shift of psi and psi dagger, and the Hamiltonian becomes like this. And this gives a typical picture of time evolution of multibus. Because the first term gives the time evolution of each, each, each universe, and actually the Hamiltonian for each universe in terms of the first quantization is just this part. This error comes from the commutation duration here. So this is a uh, Hamiltonian for the, in the uh, first quantization. So from this, we can see that lambda is indeed the cosmological constant. Also the, the dynamics of the size of the universe as the wrong sign. So which is good as a model of four dimensional gravity. So however, as we have seen before, the effect of small baby universes are overwhelmed by those of large universes and Coleman's mechanism does not work. So in order to circumvent this problem, let's introduce a baby universe mode, a, a data by hand. So this one is emission or absorption of baby universe by mother universe. And this term is a conversion between baby universe and zero size universe. And this one uh, represents creation of baby universe from nothing or annihilation of baby universe to nothing. And this one is uh, energy of baby universe itself. And furthermore, motivated by the fact that the topology change of macroscopic universe is largely suppressed in four dimension, we drop such terms and obtain the following simple model. As we will see now, this seems to be a good model, Hamiltonian, of four-dimensional gravity coupled with baby universes. So we want to start with uh, some comments on Lorentzian gravity. So the first comment is about topology change in Lorentzian gravity. And in the Lorentzian signature, 
classically, topology change is forbidden. However, in the WKB approximation, topology change can be described by connecting Lorentzian and Euclidean signature. In general, it is difficult to formulate Lorentzian path integral rigorously when there is a topology change. However, for macroscopic universes, topology change is highly suppressed if d is greater than, than two, because the transition probability is proportional to exponential of the classical action here. On the other hand, if one of the universes is small, actually baby universes, there is no suppression for topology change. But in this case, emission and absorption of baby universes can be approximated by operator insertions. And we can describe them by rather simple equation like this. The second comment is the, on the big crunch. So in principle, the universe can disappear to nothing after big crunch, which is the inverse process of the creation of the universe from nothing. However, in the case of Lorentzian gravity, once the universe becomes macroscopic, it cannot easily disappear to nothing through a big crunch because matter fields are highly excited and the overlap with the vacuum state is very small. So the third comment is, uh, what is the baby universe in this model? So for simplicity, we assume all universes have S3 topology. Then the creation of small universe from nothing can be described by the mini superspace Hamiltonian. Here R is a radius of the S3 universe. And on the right hand side, minus R is a curvature term and M is the energy of the spatially constant modes of the field. Then the potential for R is a flipping sign of this and is given like this. So if uh, lambda and M are order one in Planck unit, the potential looks like this. Therefore, there is a potential barrier, potential barrier for the universe to pop out from nothing. And furthermore, in some region of lambda M plane, a metastable state exists near R equals zero, which can be regarded as a baby universe. So with these preparations, it is natural to consider the following model Hamiltonian for the four-dimensional Lorentzian universe. And here we consider the mini superspace, uh, but to introduce the other degrees of freedom is not difficult. And uh, here I, I would like to mention uh, Recently, Ambion, Sato, and Watabiki uh, considered a similar Hamiltonian from different uh, point of view. So the meaning of the Hamiltonian is the following. So the first line describes time evolution of each universe. And second line is conversion between baby universe and small universe. And the third line describes annihilation or creation of baby universe to or from nothing. And last line, it gives time evolution of baby universe. So, uh, this, so I want to say now that this model Hamiltonian suggests a mechanism for the automatic fine tuning of the cosmological constant. So here, let's consider an even simpler model. Here, lambda L is a vacuum energy, a vacuum energy density as a function of the size. And a size L is actually that volume of the universe. And the C and the new uh, constant and L0 is close to zero. And in this model, A, da, A plus A daga, which I call Q, is a conserved quantity so that we can take any time independent wave function for Q. So the important point is that the cosmological constant is log to zero, no matter what wave function for Q we take. And more precisely, the bare cosmological constant Q is automatically adjusted to the marginal value of the open and closed universe. In other words, the physical cosmological constant in the late stage of the universe is almost there. This is what we want to show now. So actually this Hamiltonian is equivalent to the Laurentian path integral of the multibus with one form. But here we consider the problem, 
in the Hamiltonian formalism. So we start with the Heisenberg equation for Psi. And this equation has a unique static C number solution, which is easily calculated by the WKB approximation. And we are, uh, here we have set L0 equal to zero. Then the asymptotic multiple state in the T infinity limit is given by the coherent state using that classical wave function. And here N is a normalization constant. And this is exactly what we see in the path integral. And the question is at which level we take the integration over the coupling constant lambda. So one possibility is before normalizing psi, this means without N. And the other possibility is after normalizing psi. This means with n. And since the path integral naturally gives a choice one, so here we assume it in the following. So thus we take the following form as a multibus state. And interestingly, this is equivalent to take the following non Hermitian Hamiltonian instead of the original one. So the Hermitian Hamiltonian one. Hamiltonian Hamiltonian has creation and annihilation tempo, but uh, this corresponds, this is because the normalized state is given by this expression. Here, the, this part is Hamiltonian. But I'm dropping the second term in the exponent corresponds to consider the time evolution by dropping this term. And physically, what we have done here is to consider the creation of a universe from nothing but do not take the annihilation of the universe to nothing. So in some sense, this is natural to assume because as we have discussed, a universe with high excitation of matter fields has very small overlap with the state of nothing. On the other hand, a universe around the ground state can be easily created from nothing. So at any rate, the entropy of the universe keeps increasing and it, it is not natural it is not unnatural that the multibus is effectively described by a non Hamiltonian Hamiltonian like this. So it is also worth noting that H reduce looks similar to the proper time Hamiltonian of the two dimensional Euclidean gravity. So if we flip the direction of time, so these two, this is a proper time Hamiltonian and this is our effective Hamiltonian and they are equivalent. The according to our assumption, we can compare different values of the coupling constant for the unnormalized state. So in particular, we can consider the norm of this state, psi. A norm of this state is given by that. And using the WKB solution, uh, we can calculate the exponent as this. The point is, uh, since we have uh, uh, this expression from WKB, uh, we have uh, this one, one of a square root lambda effective lambda. So this can be very large if uh, lambda L becomes zero at large L. So therefore in the space of the coupling constant, the norm of the multibus has a very strong peak around the values for which the time evolution of the universe becomes marginal. That is the physical cosmological constant in the late stage of the universe is almost zero. So let's see how the marginal situation is realized in the late stage of our universe. So for simplicity, we assume that our universe will become radiation dominated at the late stage. Then we have uh, this expression. Here L is uh, R cube. So, so this is a uh, radiation and this is curvature. The point is uh, when C is given, C is a total radiation. Then by tuning lambda, we can make uh, this quantity largest. And, and actually this one becomes largest if this situation is uh, satisfied. And this situation is satisfied if these three terms are comparable. Then the largest value of this is around C, C square and C is a, a total radiation. Because the total radiation is nothing but the total entropy, we find the following principle we call maximum entropy principle. So coupling constants are determined in such a way that 
the total entropy of the universe in the late stage is maximum. And we may understand the flatness of the Higgs potential as a consequence of this principle. If we accept the inflation scenario in which universe pops out from nothing and then inflate, most of the entropy of the universe is generated at the stage of reheating just after the inflation stops. Therefore, the potential of the inflation should be tuned in such a way that inflation occurs as long as possible. So if the Higgs field plays a role of inflaton, the above analysis asserts that the standard model parameters are tuned such that the Higgs potential becomes flat at high energy scale. And actually, uh, this is the analysis, uh, the result of the analysis of, of the renormalization group. And, uh, and if we fix up Higgs uh, mass to this value, then the, the behavior of potential depends on the mass, top core mass. And uh, for this one, we have some flat potential. And this is within two standard deviation of the present uh, experiment. So I think uh, uh, we can de develop, develop uh, phenomenology further, but uh, I think uh, since time is running, and I think I should skip here. You have around five minutes. Mm -hmm. Five minutes, yeah, thank you. So, so maybe okay, I will briefly uh, talk about this. So, so in general, we need to know C as a function of the coupling constant to apply the ma maximum entropy principle. However, under some circumstances, we can find the position of the minimum without knowing the detail of C. So for example, uh, we can consider sim sim symmetric point, uh, and this corresponds to uh, uh, theta QCD, and also edge of drastic change. And then, uh, uh, for example, cosmological constant is edge of drastic change, close and of universe, and Higgs inflation, as we have seen, and classical conformality. So in this way, we may introduce the generalized multi-critical point principle. So that the coupling constants, which are relevant in the low energy region, are tuned to such values that changing them would dramatically alter the history of the universe. And of course, there are many open questions. For example, for Higgs potential, we do not know which one is payback by nature. So flat potential or degenerate. Well, we, still we have to explain the origin of the weak scale. And also our cosmological constant is not exactly zero. And also we want to know how many parameters are tuned. So to summarize, uh, baby universe in Lorentzian signature may be understood even by the present tool of field theory and string theory. And we can also derive phenomenological consequences such as Higgs inflation and dark matter mass. So the, the idea of big fix suggests the following picture. The rough structure of our universe is determined by the string dynamics and the detailed parameters are fixed by the big fix. And in the latter, parameters are fixed irrespectively to the detail of the model. So one of the interesting directions along this line is to see how multiverse or baby universes look like in non-commutative field theory or matrix model. Actually, there are several interesting attempts to examine uh, expanding universe by matrix model. So it must be interesting to see uh, multiverse and baby universes in such a way. So at any rate, uh, there is a lot that needs to be clarified about baby universe, but I think it is worth in investigating. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so let's start. Hello, just uh, one question. When you're talking about the topology change, yes, in the case of four dimensional manifolds, you mean topology change of 
say, three-dimensional manifold times sort of time, so sort of hyperbolic mm -hmm. picture. Mm -hmm. and then, I mean, which topology for the three-dimensional? Because, I mean, the classification okay, of... So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a very good point. So for three-dimension, uh, so if we consider S2 as a topology of the universe, so in order to consider, uh, I, I think the simple topology change is S2, splits to 2S2. Uh, is it okay? I mean, uh, uh, this is for Sorry, I, I'm afraid the connect, connection is not uh, good. So, so, so could you repeat? Uh, so the, the question is when you consider topology change for the three-dimensional manifolds. Oh, three-dimensional manifold, okay, yes. So, so the four-dimensional manifold is a three-dimensional manifold. Oh, okay, so, so for example, S3, right? This is our universe, S3. Okay, and then the topology yeah. change is three. Yeah, to topology three. change means S3 is split to two S3, for example. Okay, so no sort of uh, more complicated topologies like, uh, you know, the quotients of S3 or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, so, so yeah, yeah, okay. But uh, here I have uh, S3 in my mind. So, okay. so I, I, I haven't uh, discussed a very complicated topology. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, any further questions here? Yeah, I'm afraid the connection is not very good. I cannot hear. We have to change the battery of the microphone. Yeah, sorry, I cannot hear at all. So, 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 so is there any question? We're changing the battery of the. So, wait a, wait a second. We will try again. So, what? So, yeah, somehow I cannot hear at all. So, so do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, somehow I cannot hear. So, so what, what should I do? <laughs> hear me now? Hello? You hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I hear. I hear you. Yes. So, oh, my uh, my question is the following: In the beginning, you discuss this, uh, you know, that um, uh, vacuum fluctuation. I mean, uh, zero point energies when you sum, they give a contribution to the. People think that it gives a co contribution to the cosmological constant, which is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. up to the four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now, recently, there was an article of Donahue, mm -hmm. where it calculated not only energy density but mm -hmm. also uh, the the pressure and the tensor, uh, energy momentum tensor T mu nu become mm -hmm. uh, lambda to the four multiplied and then a diagonal matrix with one, and then comma, one third, one third, one third. And then you calculate mm -hmm. trace is equal to zero. So mm -hmm. the conclusion is that if you carefully calculate the energy momentum tensor of uh, uh, zero point energies, actually it does not contribute to the uh, cosmological constant. That's a... Mm -hmm. uh, if you know this uh, this public it was recently don't you published okay sorry i do not know how it is related uh, to my argument here so i'm sorry so it is I, I, I simply get the, the standard of uh, picture of uh, cosmological constant and uh from a uh, uh, vacuum loop you have some contribution and even from interaction you have some contribution so so cosmological constant, uh, we, we should uh, find some mechanism to tune the physical cosmological constant to zero. So, so this is my, my uh, standing point. So I, I'm sorry, I do not know how it is related to, to your comment. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, one more last question.
Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Probably so. Oh, so yes. I understood that you argue that the value of the cosmological constant was set to maximize the increase of entropy during inflation. Yes. Can you also argue something about the value of the Higgs field? And mm -hmm. the question is, can you along the same lines argue that the universe exists because existing universe has a larger entropy than non-existent mm -hmm. one? Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so, sorry, I, so I don't get the point. So, so yes, yes, mm -hmm. uh, whether you can say something about the Higgs field. Um, by Higgs field, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and is it in agreement with the observed value? Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Thank you very much. That, that's a very good point. So, so okay. So, so suppose we fix uh, Higgs mass to this value, and then so this uh, renormalization group or uh, flow depends on the top cock mass. So, the top cock mass uh, has the most uh, uh, uncertainty now. So, but uh, in order to tune or uh, this uh, flat potential. Top cock mass should be tuned like this, 171 point something. But uh, this is within two standard deviation of present exp experiments. And, and five years ago, <laughs> it was uh, much uh, worse. It was uh, four sigma or something. But now somehow it's, it's coming to cross to this value. So uh, it's within two standard deviation of the present experiment experiments. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, let's quickly check if there are online. Okay, there are no questions online, so uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. And we move to the second talk this morning. Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Good morning, good morning. Yes, we can hear you. And uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see and, uh, okay, so the title of our second talk this morning is Key Anomalies on the Higgs Branch. So please go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to start by thanking, thanking the organizers, and I, I hope that the next time I can actually be there and, and enjoy the sun of Kerkira. And, and maybe also it is very appropriate to thank Humboldt Foundation, because this is how I got to Germany, and now I am here and I enjoy very much being here. So, yeah. And uh, this, is, this work is in collaboration with uh, Vasilis Nyarchos, Kostis Papagiorgakis, uh, Alessandro Pini, who was a postdoc in Hamburg, here with us. Uh, now he's uh, back to Italy. And Enrico Andriolo, who is an amazing PhD student and is graduating this year. So if someone is hiring, they should pay attention to his application. Um, and let's start uh, nicely and slowly. Uh, so we will, all, we will be talking about conformal field theories in uh, even dimensions and okay more or less it will all be for four dimensions but most of it can be thought of through for two for six and whenever you couple uh, cfts to gravity you see that the effective action cannot simultaneously preserve diffeomorphisms and vile transformations and this is the famous uh, anomaly uh, which is manifest precisely in this class between the conservation of the stress energy tensor and its racelessness. And usually what people do is they say, oh, conservation is very important, we will preserve it, uh, and, but we pay a price, we will lose tracelessness. Yes, and uh, here is... Uh, a vile transformation and by taking derivatives with respect uh, to this parameter sigma, we get the anomaly. And here is the famous anomaly for, uh, for D. So we have a piece, uh, the coefficient of which is the famous A anomaly and it multiplies the Euler density. 
and there is another coefficient C, which multiplies the vial tension. So this was meant to be more of a review. Also, maybe this slide, some of the people that they like this stuff, maybe no, maybe some people don't. So conformal anomalies are classified in two classes. And the classification uh, asks one question. Does the anomaly introduce a scale? And there are anomalies that don't introduce a scale, and these are of type A. And anomalies that do introduce a scale, and these are called type B. Type A anomalies, conformal anomalies, are really great because first of all, they can be expressed in terms of topological invariance, precisely like the chiral anomalies. And this is also why I wrote this sentence here. They are really, really similar to chiral anomalies. So you can really use your intuition for them. And uh, what is even more important, they are known to match across different phases. And this was famously used in this very beautiful paper to derive the A theorem. So when I want to study type B anomalies, in my mind, I want really eventually to be able to say things the way they did. And yes, here I have one example from the slide before is the A anomaly. Uh, now type B anomalies, which is the one that I want to study with this uh, presentation. Uh, first of all, they depend on the scale. Very importantly, they are highly non-trivial functions of couplings. So they are not just a number like uh, chiral anomalies. And we have no idea, we have no reason why they should match, at least as of now. And uh, a famous example is the C coefficient in the equation that I saw before. And in fact, there is not only the C coefficient, there is a whole class of uh, uh, type B anomalies, which come about when you study two point functions of operators with integer scaling dimension. So what is this talk about? This talk about is to precisely address this very basic question. Should type, anomal type B anomalies match Yes or no, and why? And I will give I will give you concrete examples of matching, and concrete examples of non-matching. And I will phrase a criterion, which basically this is the most important part of the work: why and when they should match. And uh, my concrete examples uh, I will take them from n equal to two superconformal field theories for which actually we have uh, non-perturbative techniques we can use, and we can really compute everything and understand everything perfectly. And in order for me to break conformal symmetry spontaneously, what I will do is that I will begin with my n equal to two theory, and I will go to the Higgs branch in which conformal symmetry is broken spontaneously. Great. Mm, so in the CFT phase, we can calculate this type of two-point functions. This is all from this paper of Swimmer and Tyson back from 2010. Uh, so this coefficient precisely here of the two-point function that multiplies the log, and here you see the scale dependence, this is the anomaly in the CFT phase. And... Uh, they showed that this coefficient also appears in the three-point function of the stress energy tensor together with the, these two operators. And again, a note here, and I will keep repeating it throughout the talk, these operators have integer, uh, integer conformal dimension, so it's two plus an integer in my notation. Yes. And because I will do n equal to two so that I can calculate everything beautiful, beautifully, this coefficient here is an exact result that I can obtain uh, using localization. And we will see with our eyes that this is a function that is highly non-trivial in the coupling constant dependence. So here is the plan of the talk. First of all, I will uh, quickly sketch how you get this, how you begin with a two-point function and this coefficient here is the anomaly. 
and why the same coefficient appears here in the three-point function. First in the CFT phase, and then I will define the anomaly as this coefficient in any phase. Then the moment I have this coefficient, I will derive for you a novel uh, word identity, which holds both in the CFT phase and in the spontaneously broken uh, phase, in which says that this conformal anomaly is covariant, covariantly constant under the covariant derivative that tells us how we move on the conformal manifold. I will, I will explain all of these things, what they are in detail. But the point is that the moment we have this beautiful equation, first order differential equation, actually all we need in life is one more thing and then we can phrase our criterion. And the criterion will be the following, covariantly constants with a relationship. So on one point on the conformal manifold, I can check if the Higgs phase and the conformal phase anomaly match. If they match at one point, they always match because of this. If they don't match, they will never match. And precisely because I can go to any point of the conformal manifold, I will go to the weak coupling and do a very nice Feynman diagram calculation. Oops, sorry for this. So this will be enough. And uh, what we will learn, first of all, I will phrase uh, uh, conjectures or, or, and classify when matching should happen and when matching should not happen. And when matching happens, we get for free an exact result on the Higgs branch that nobody knew how to do before, just by doing a CFT computation, which is quite fantastic. And when mis mismatching uh, uh, happens, we will get novel restrictions on the conformal manifold. So we will learn new things about the conformal manifold of conformal field theories, which is also fantastic. So let's begin with the Schwimmer and Tyson, and let's review how to see that the anomaly is related with this two-point function and this three-point function. So here I have written I mean, in small letters, because we don't need to pay attention too much to the details right now, but what you can find in any old Osborne papers from the 90s. So the word identity for diffeomorphisms and the word identity for vial transformations. And if you decide to go to the Q to zero, which is Q is the momentum of the stress energy tensor. And then of course, because of conservation of momenta, the momenta of the two operators, they have to be equal then. So the moment you do that, you discover from Diffeo that this coefficient A, which we can pull out from here, so we can take the three-point function, write it in all the possible tensors that can appear, and corner the ones that come with a metric. And in particular, okay, we also take out a little bit of a piece of a two-point function. This is to make things beautiful. So this coefficient has to be zero from Diffeo. From vial transformations, you do the same and you don't get the same. You get that this coefficient A has to be proportional to the two-point function. So that's precisely the class and that's precisely the anomaly. And the most important lesson of this slide is that the anomaly coefficient is proportional to the two-point function. Again, very importantly, when we are on the CFT phase. Then we want to break conformal theory uh, symmetry spontaneously. And for that, we need to know what the dilaton is because this is how we will do it. So the dilaton is the massless ghost tone boson that is associated with the spontaneous breaking of conformal symmetry. And how it comes about. So we start with any theory that has some scalar fields and we shift them, we give them a VEV. And of course, this will create new couplings, but in particular, it will create, so most of the fields will become massive. And then we start going in our Lagrangian and we try to find the massless guys. And you will always find when you do this, one real scalar that it's massless, and this is the dilaton. And by starting writing the effective action, you, it will of course have a nice uh, kinetic term as a real scalar. Most importantly is this, it will have a linear coupling to the trace of the stress energy tensor. And this will be the only guy that can actually do that. 
And by the way, by taking equation of motion just from this, you see then that the trace of the stress energy tensor is not zero anymore, but it's proportional to the VEV, which breaks conformal symmetry and uh, the kinetic term on the dilaton. So dilaton tells us how the trace of the stress energy tensor uh, is not zero anymore. Now, and precisely because of this, we immediately see that in the broken phase, the analytic structure of the, co of the correlators will be very different from the CFT one. And in fact, we have to watch out for poles, precisely because of this, of the dilaton propagator. So let's now repeat the Schwimmer-Tyson uh, procedure for the anomaly, but for a broken phase when there is a dilaton. We should do what I just said. So you should watch out for poles of the dilaton propagator when it couples to the stress energy tensor. So we will not have just this A coefficient anymore. There will be another coefficient, which precisely we cannot ignore anymore because we can have a pole. So that we will multiply by this Q squared and we will still have a finite thing. And the same thing we can do for the uh, vile uh, word identity. In this case, things are more messy, but we still see that there is a class but there is a lesson precisely because of this complication. The anomaly coefficient now is not directly related to the two-point function, but that's not a problem. Here is how we can actually extract the anomaly coefficient from the three-point function by taking the appropriate derivative with respect to the momenta of these two operators, and in the very end, carefully taking the limit that all of these things go to zero. So this is how I will calculate my Higgs branch uh, anomaly coefficient, type B anomaly coefficient. Now, okay, a little bit of technology. I apologize if it's too baroque for uh, so early in the morning. <laughs> there are two things we need to know from uh, uh, conformal n equal to two theories to move on. Thing number one is what are these Coulomb branch operators? So these Coulomb branch operators, they live in specific multiplets of uh, n equal to two 4D uh, uh, representations. In fact, they are beautiful short multiplets. They are the top component. And if you want to have you know, a, an explicit form for a Lagrangian theory, this is how they look. They look like trace phi to some power. They are uh, in short representation, so they obey shortening conditions. They are chiral, so they, all the Q bars kill them. All the S's and all the S bars kill them because they precisely they are primaries. And not only that, there is one more uh, beautiful property that I would like you to remember they have, is that when you set L equal to two, so the first possible uh, trace phi squared uh, guy that you can write down, at the bottom of their multiplet, they contain the exact marginal deformations. So this is another very cool thing to, and we will use it also. So having said that, I need to tell you now a tiny little bit about the conformal manifold because we will be moving on it and we will be taking derivatives on it. So very naively in life, before you know anything about covariant derivatives, you would just take derivatives with respect to the coupling constants. But if you just take a derivative, you see that things don't go well because then you can you know, move around the conformal manifold and you can discover that there is curvature <laughs> so you, you, you slowly, slowly by playing, you discover that there is in fact a, a Riemannian structure there. So then you, in, you, you can define a, a covariant uh, derivative precisely the way we learn in general relativity. And the way it acts is like this. So taking a covariant derivative with respect to the marginal coupling, what it does, so we have a normal correlator with however many insertions you like, it drops a marginal operator down. And of course, this has to be integrated. And by the way, to see this, you just take a stupid derivative with respect to the coupling and you see the Lagrangian falling down, right? 
And of course, this object needs to be appropriately regulated. I'm not going to say anything about this in this talk because it would take forever and it, I would be really out of time. But if you want in the end, you can ask me. This is very well understood. And uh, one last thing, the moment you want to study Coulomb branch operators, there are these very beautiful papers that you can read and you can compute two fi point functions using localization. Great. So now let's go, I want to prove for you uh, the word identity. In fact, I will prove it to you in one possible way, but uh, there are many other beautiful ways. And one of the coming papers that we will have is a very general nice proof that doesn't care about supersymmetry, doesn't care about anything, but let me do it now using supersymmetry. So I write here for you uh, the n equal to two uh, 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 super uh, conformal word identity. Here I have the insertion of the supercurrent and here the super conformal generators act appropriately to all the operators in my correlator. And what I want to do, I want to calculate the covariant derivative with respect to the modular coupling on the anomaly coefficient, which will come up from this three-point correlator as we discussed. So when I do that, as I said in the previous um, slide, I drop down a marginal operator. So now this is the correlator I need to study. Well, this is great because the marginal operator, as I said in the previous slide, is a descendant of trace phi squared. So this is great. I write it like this as a descendant. And then I use the superconformal word identity on this correlator. And immediately, just because of the properties of these multiplets, I get zero on the right-hand side, which is enough to prove <clears throat> this. The same type of thing you can do in the Higgs phase. Of course, remember, it is very important that we have to take the limit of the momentum of the stress energy tensor to go to zero slowly precisely because there are poles of the dilaton. But there is one more thing that we need to be careful about when we do this, because we are doing supersymmetry now. So the dilaton has a supersymmetric partner, the dilatino. And the same way the dilaton couples to the trace of the stress energy tensor, the dilatino can actually couple to the supercurrent. So when you want to compute, this object as before. And okay, now I'm all in momentum space and I am taking a limit in the very end. There can be such poles, right? So great. So what can happen in the word identity? The right hand side goes through identically as I explained before, but you have to now consider the left hand side and in particular this type of objects. Well, long story short, the correlation function with the dilatino can only contribute by boundary terms, precisely because this was the term with the derivative. And when you put down this and you compute this guy, in the end, you find that there is no possible term that can actually affect the anomaly. So you find that this uh, word identity also holds in the Higgs branch. So this is amazing because if we have these word identities, so we have basically this is covariantly constant and this is covariantly constant, we can now phrase the criterion of matching of type B anomalies. So we can put them together in this nicely uh, looking um, first order differential equation. And then we can immediately see what I want. If we can also show that the anomalies match at one point of the conformal manifold, let's call it lambda star. This means that they have to match at any point because of this. That's the criterion. And that's great because the weak coupling is also <laughs> a point on the conformal manifold. And uh, we can do weak coupling perturbation theory to check what's going on. So let's now go and study concrete examples. 
And uh, let's first uh, use uh, super conformal uh, QCD uh, for our first example. And we can take super conformal QCD with color group some as UK. And uh, of course, uh, the number of flavors in order for it to be conformal, it has to be 2K. By the way, this computation, I am just saying here that I'm doing for SUK, but in fact, I can do it for any color group. It doesn't matter. Uh, you just have to do your appropriate uh, gymnastics with the coefficients that come out. I need to compute this diagram in the Higgs phase. In the uh, CFT phase, I am not even telling you how to do the calculation because it's a super easy two-point function that has been calculated before us in many different ways. So I don't even need to tell how to do it. So for the Higgs phase, this is the Feynman diagram. The stress energy tensor comes in. The, dil the dilaton uh, propagates out of the stress energy tensor and couples to all the massive scalars which are here in the loop. By the way, for people that have ever tried to do anything like that, this is a super hard calculation. And in some sense, this is borderline in the, um, uh, you know, the level where we are right now being able to do such integrals. These are the famous L loop banana integrals, massive banana integrals. And uh, we did some really cool uh, calculations to be able to extract the coefficients out of the banana integral that we wanted. So this, this actually, this work may have interesting things even for the people that care about amplitudes. But this is an aside. The point for us is that we were able to compute this. Here I wrote full glory, everything with coefficients, and we get precisely the same answer as in the CFT. So what we say is that the Higgs branch anomaly matches with a CFT result. So we have, this is the first example of matching. And again, any one node uh, theory will do this. Now we go to another class of n equal to two theories, which is more complicated. So we want to study more general quivers. And well, usually this is a paradigmatic quiver people come up with when they are, you know, people that they like to do Gaiotto stuff, classes, blah, blah, blah. So this is a circular quiver with the same type of node everywhere. Let's just take it to be uh, as UK for now. Again, the diagram is the same that we need to compute. The only difference is that the operators that you can put here can come from different nodes. And in fact, also for, for people that know a little bit about orbifolds, you can uh, do a discrete Fourier transform and uh, organize your basis of trace phi to the L type operators in untwisted and twisted uh, um, uh, uh, fashion. And here I have the Higgs branch anomaly for some uh, uh, operator in twisted or untwisted, uh, you know, alpha. And then I do my calculation. And uh, for the first time I see something, there is no matching. So here is the CFT result. And the Higgs result has this extra thing, one over n to the L. So there is no matching. So at the beginning, in fact, because at the beginning we cared about studying deconstruction, which is a, a, a limit where this n goes to infinity. So at the beginning we froze actually. We were like, oh, there is no matching. So deconstruction is going to have a problem. But then we observed that when n goes to infinity, this goes away. So everything is good. But nonetheless, for finite n, this is the first example of non-matching. But there is a slightly extra thing that I need you to pay attention to. Let's look at the mode where a, a alpha is equal to zero. So the untwisted case, which is something like a center of mass uh, um, field. So the moment you do that, the untwisted scalars, when you just write your Lagrangian out, they, they do not couple to the dilaton as expected. But they actually can, precisely because they are massless. So here we have two massless guys. We have the, uh, the dilaton and the center of mass mode. They can directly couple to the stress energy tensor. This happens only when you have quivers that can have this type of mode. And then you can compute this extra contribution uh, 
and it precisely amazingly killed this guy and for the untwisted mode you get matching again. So let's summarize the slides. For any general twisted mode, you will not have matching, but for the untwisted guy, you get matching precisely because it's extra contribution. So let's now make uh, theorems. Let's organize what we learned into theorems. Conjectures, of course, because yeah, we are not mathematicians and also we didn't study non-Lagrangian theories. So, the first case was super QCD. And in super QCD, when you go to the Higgs branch, in the very much in the IR, you get a trivial chiral ring. No one is left, all the operators are lifted. So in such a case, in type 2B, the type 2B anomalies match along the Higgs branch uh, RG flow. So matching. When there is a non-trivial IR chiral ring, and this is precisely the example that I showed second, because the untwisted mode is massless, so he will survive all the way down to the extreme IR. Generically, there is no matching for all the different twisted uh, uh, modes. However, the mode that precisely corresponds to the one that survives in the IR, for this mode, there is matching. And there is a small, other smaller uh, little conjecture, which also is really cute, that as long as you can check matching for the generators, you have matching for the full chiral ring, which is also very nice because you don't have to do the whole calculation. Okay. Um, okay, maybe the time is passing and this slide is maybe too much. The only thing that I wanted to say with this slide is we know how to compute uh, these anomaly coefficients in the CFT phase using localization. And we do this by taking the Peston partition function and taking the derivative with respect to the coupling constants. And you see that what you get is a highly non-trivial function of the couplings. And, and if you have further questions, you can ask me. And by the way, maybe one thing to, 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 to say is that this computation is super difficult and you get a super complicated trans series with respect to instanton corrections. So there is really like a lot of uh, uh, wealth here and the computation is very difficult. <laughs> um, at least technically. In, in practice is easy, in, in, in theory is easy, in practice is super hard. So let's now consider the consequences of mismatching because here we learn also something cool and new. So, and what we will learn is we will learn new things about the conformal manifold. So up to now, I mean, this is the, the latest paper that you can read to learn things about the conformal manifold. Okay, there is another paper by Dachikawa that corrects a small mistake that they made, but it's okay for now. Um, conformal manifold, the maximal we know is that they are kehler hodge manifolds. Uh, so basically, if you have a conformal manifold with complex dimension N, we know that the holonomy should be a subgroup of UN. That's all we know, nothing else. <clears throat> now, with, with the mismatch, we have new data. We know that the covariant derivative uh, or with respect to the marginal coupling on the CFT uh, anomaly coefficient, by the way, this is also called the homologic of metric, <laughs> uh, is zero. But now there is a second uh, uh, rank two tensor who has the same property. And yeah, when, the, when there is mismatching, they are just not equal. So there is honestly, there exists a second covariantly constant uh, tensor that does this, it's, which is like, you can go to my own mathematician friend and ask what happens when this happens. And by the way, it's very important to stress that this nabla here, this covariant derivative is the same in both cases. So what this does is that this imposes restriction to the holonomy group. And this is amazing because this is an indirect way to get constraints on the conformal manifold by studying physics of the Higgs branch. 
Time is a little bit running, but maybe let me tell you very quickly what are the workings of this mismatching. So if I just knew localization and CFT, I would go ahead and do this complicated calculation, as I said, compute the metrics, plug them in this formula uh, for the connection. And uh, well, I could get, I can get, I've done this, it's in the paper, the holonomy. And what you see is that locally, this manifold decomposes to irreducible one-dimensional Kerr manifolds. But this takes a very hard calculation and you have to use mathematica and you have to struggle and sweat. If you use the mismatch, you can do actually a three-level calculation. <laughs> and just by uh, looking at how this uh, anomaly coefficients look, you can immediately see that uh, the, isometry, uh, the isotropy group is immediately U1 times UN. And of course, this immediately uh, begs for how can we actually really get this? Well, either you do harder things and you go to higher loops, or you can do something simple. You can actually study different Higgsing patterns so that you can actually get this. Okay, I hope I was not very late. I think I started also later, so I shouldn't feel bad. Let me conclude. So we began by reviewing from the beautiful paper of Swimmer and Tyson uh, that uh, the anomaly coefficient of the three, uh, we can see this in the three point function for the CFT, CFT phase, this GIJ also appears in the two point function. And when we have supersymmetry, this is an exact result. So we know this thing and it's a highly non-trivial function of the couplings. Uh, then the second thing that I did for you is that I derived a, a novel word identity, which holds both in the CFT and on the Higgs branch and tells you that these anomaly coefficients are covariantly constant of the conformal manifold. And then precisely because of this, I was able to phrase a matching condition. So as long as you can do a calculation anywhere you want in the conformal manifold, in particular weak coupling, which we know how to do, then this is enough for a check. Do they match, yes or no? And uh, here is the important, uh, 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 like if you want classification of what can happen. Either in the Higgs branch, in the extreme IR, the chiral ring is empty, and then the anomalies have to match. Or there is something left over, and then for what is left over, the anomalies should always match. However, from any other, for any other operator which is lifted in the IR and it's not even there anymore in the extreme IR, matching is not expected to happen. Okay, this was a side little uh, uh, theorem that allows you to, to cut and have to do less calculations. As long as you can check matching for the generators of the chiral ring, you get matching for the full chiral ring. What is very important is that as long as there is anomaly matching, you get for free an exact results on the Higgs branch using localization from the CFT phase. And when there is a mismatch, you get these nice new restrictions on the holonomy group. And uh, well, what can we do with these things? I mean, the most important thing that we could do is that we could try to do similar things with the A, A theorem derivation. Now for this type B anomaly uh, uh, um, coefficients, this would be fantastic. And this would teach us things about RG flows. Uh, another very cool thing we could try to do is we could start looking at different uh, uh, Higgsing patterns and again do three level type calculations and this should really further restrict the holonomy and actually if you study any of them you should be able to get the full answer without further loop calculations. Another thing that we are looking currently at is uh, if we can learn things about cyber witten theory or you know coulomb branch operators on the coulomb branch 
in a very similar fashion. And of course, we are looking for more general lessons. And maybe one tiny little bit of thing, I will just mention it. And if someone wants to ask, they should. You can also learn things about exact deconstruction by looking at these anomalies. Thank you. Hello, uh, uh, I ask you, uh, let's take a specific example of what- Julie, can, can you say your name? Because I cannot see who you are. Oh, it's George Panos. Ah, nice. Hi. Hello. So uh, I'm interested uh, more to real physics, uh, as you might know. Great, yes. Uh, suppose you take this one to the cube, right? Uh, yes. Or as you went to the KSU, but the cube is more specific. Uh, uh, this can lead really to, to, to nice uh, results in low energies and things like that. Uh, for this specific case, uh, could you tell us, uh, also you said, uh, uh, I understood that this belongs to the second category, that you introduce a scale. Uh, could you tell us which is the scale and if the matching goes smoothly here and things like that? So, first of all, this identity yeah. holds independently of supersymmetry. I don't go, I didn't go the proof, uh, uh, but this identity holds. So, you can choose as you three, and you can have some trace five to the third, whatever guy you like. Yeah. And uh, then the only thing you need to do, I haven't done that. N equal one, let's say. Sorry? You have N equal one supersymmetry. We can, that's even better. So we can, um, do you want to start with, so what I would do if I want to study n equal to one, maybe I would actually start with SUN so that I can go on the side of the conformal window first so that I can have a conformal point and do this calculation first. Mm -hmm. Then I would Higgs get this calculation. This is all like a three level calculation. I would check if they match or not. I, my guess is that they should match. And because of this, this means that these anomalies should always match. Okay. And what would be the scale that you said? So there is no... Here is... This is the RG scale. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Is, is something happening uh, there in Corfu that I cannot see? <laughs> Hello? I'm yes. sorry, I probably forgot to switch on my microphone. So we, there were no further questions online. So we thank, we thank you again for the nice talk. Probably you didn't hear that. So, so I'm sorry. Pleasure. Right. So we move to our next speaker, Herman Nikolai. Can you hear us, Herman? Uh, yes. And uh, let's see, I was just trying to switch on the video, but the host has not, does not allow, ah, okay. Ah, now we, here we go. Yes, we can see you, we can hear you. Okay. But not anymore. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, it seems to work now again. It seems to work, and uh, now let's see. Um, let me see. 
Uh, shall we now share screen? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's. Uh, do you have the bottom or? Yes. All right, yes, we can see the screen. Can see the screen. So I now, let's see, A full screen. <clears throat> Okay. Just a moment. No, we don't see anything anymore. Resume new share. Oh, it has disappeared. Yeah, the, the screen has disappeared for the moment at least. Okay. How about yeah. this? Yeah, we can see it, yes. You can see it? Yes. Okay, so we're set or? I think everything works. So <coughs> our first speaker this morning is Herman Nikolai and he will talk about a perturbative expansion scheme for super membrane and matrix theory. So please go ahead. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, and special thanks to George and uh, Patricia for inviting me to give you to give this talk. Uh, I now realize I should have come to uh, Corfu rather than having to go to the Institute this early on a Sunday morning. But uh, here we are. I think next time I'll try to make it to Corfu next year. So the work I'm going to talk about is based on um, a paper I put on out recently with Olaf Lechtenfeld. Um, and I should also say that <clears throat> there will be a second part to this lecture which will be given later by Olaf at, in Corfu, but at a different workshop, namely quantum geometry, field theory, and gravity. Uh, but I should say, I'll try to make my part of the talk self-contained. So let's see. Okay. So first of all, I, I would like to to remind you about uh, supermembranes. This is, this is an old topic and it seems to be somewhat forgotten, uh, but actually uh, there is an extension of the superstring, something that goes beyond superstring theory and it's the unique maximally supersymmetric supermembrane theory in space-time dimension D equals 11. This was formulated in 1987 by Bergsoff, Seskin and Townsend. And as I want to argue in my seminar today, this is actually a candidate theory for a non-perturbative formulation of string theory. There are also such theories in four, five, and seven dimensions, but, uh, but uh, the one we will concentrate on in this talk is the one, the 11 dimensional one. And as was shown long ago in collaboration with Bernard de Witt and Jens Hoppe, uh, you can reconstruct this model as the end to infinity limit of a maximally supersymmetric SUN matrix theory. Uh, this model became popular much later under a different name, but uh, so I will recall in this talk how this construction goes and what this model has to do with the supermembrane. Well, as I said, uh, there's not much work on supermembranes, certainly not in recent years. And this has to do with the fact that the main unsolved problem uh, is still around, namely the quantization of the supermembrane. And the reason uh, is the following, there are several reasons. Uh, first of all, unlike for string theory, when you write down the membrane equations, there's no gauge which linearizes the equations of motion. And as a consequence, determination of quantum correlation functions can not be reduced to free field theory computations, unlike for string theory. Because if you look at how correlators are computed in string theory, at the end of the day, you're always doing kind of free field theory computations. A Polyakov-like approach was also very popular in string theory, appears hopeless in view of the nonlinearities. And finally, this theory classically is formulated in 11 dimensions, but would just like for string theory, one would like to understand whether there's such a thing as a quantum critical dimension, which should be equal to 11 in this case. 
So already at the time, it seemed like the only realistically feasible approach is a light cone gauge condensation in a flat back background. That's another limitation. Um, and uh, so they can make some progress, but again, there remain difficulties and these difficulties also merit, merit by corresponding different difficulties in the M-theory matrix model. Namely, first of all, concerning the existence and properties of the end to infinity limit. This is actually what you want to, to, uh, to do. You really want to take the limit into infinity. There's an issue with uh, target space Lorentz invariance, as was again shown long ago that for the matrix model, classical Lorentz invariance is broken from finite n, but can be recovered in the end to infinity limit. But the big open question is how do you can you extend this, these considerations to the, to the quantum theory? This is what, I mean, one way, for example, in string theory to establish that the critical dimension of the superstring is t equals 10. And finally, there's no analog of the Veneziano formula, which is the kind of emblematic formula for string theory. Um, again, because of the nonlinearities. And the question is, are there quantum supermembrane vertex operators, which you can used to compute correlators. Now the present approach is based on the fact that uh, you can reformulate supermembrane theory as a, as a one-dimensional gauge theory of supersymmetric gauge theory of area preserving diffeomorphisms. This is something I will now explain. And if you could uh, properly control this gauge theory, then uh, you could even skip the SUN approximation and deal directly with the SU infinity theory. So let me start out by uh, explaining some supermembrane basics. And this is actually goes back to the work of Bergsov, Seskin and Townsend, but I will follow uh, the presentation of my old paper with Bernard de Witt and Jens Hoppe. Um, and uh, which you may also consult for further details on this. So we're dealing with a, a super membrane. So that means we have a target super space uh, with coordinate X mu and a target space spinners, which are 32 component spinners to start with. And these target space coordinates depend on three world volume coordinates labeled uh, IJ one of a one, two, one, a zero, one, two. So there's a time-like coordinate tau and there's space-like space coordinate sigma r or sigma one, sigma two. Well, there's a, the, the Lagrangian that they write down is a generalization of the Green-Schwartz action for the superstring with kappa symmetry and so on. Uh, I will not uh, go into those details, but what you see here is simply the target space uh, uh, field bind and uh, then you compute from this in the usual way, the induced target space, uh, uh, induced uh, world volume metric in this, in this way. And omega mu nu, uh, eta mu nu is the uh, Minkowski metric in target space. Since we want to go to uh, quantize the theory in the light cone gauge, we switch to light cone coordinates, which are defined in the usual way, as you can see here. And furthermore, exploit uh, the symmetries of the original uh, Lagrangian to uh, go to a light cone gauge where you identify the X plus coordinate, ta target space coordinate with the, with the time coordinate on the world volume. And furthermore, impose this projection condition on the target space uh, spinner. And with these, uh, uh, formulas, you can know it's rather straightforward to compute the induced metric on the membrane world volume, uh, which you see here. So the GRS, that's the spatial part of the induced metric. So that's uh, a two by two matri uh, metric now. And uh, to distinguish it, I'll put a bar on it. So wherever you see a bar, it's just the spatial metric with an uh, inverse it also has a bar on it, which is defined here. Then we have the time time component, which is this. It contains the X minus coordinate. And then there's an off diagonal piece. So this is a, a straightforward computation. And now we have to uh, formulate a Lagrangian 
And the Lagrangian is just, well, at the end of the day, it just boils down to the usual number go to Lagrangian, where we calculate simply the um, square root of the induced, um, the determinant of the induced world volume metric, which you see here. So this is the standard formula. And uh, uh, you see that we have uh, split off, uh, we write this determinant as a determinant of the two by two spatial metric times an extra factor. This is by the way, a standard formula how to express n by n uh, determinants in terms of n minus one by n minus one determinants. So this is quite a standard formula uh, where G bar is the spatial uh, uh, metric determinant. And this delta factor involves G0 zero as well as the off diagonal components, which I showed on the previous slide. And then the Lagrangian simply becomes this. Uh, which is the formula you see here. So this is just the uh, metric determinant. So this is Nambu Goto action for the membrane plus a fermionic piece. As you can see, there's only one free parameter in this theory, which is the membrane tension. And the membrane tension is nominally of uh, dimension mass uh, to the third power, uh, mass dimension three. And uh, we here will simply render it dimensionless by rescaling with respect to some reference mass. You can take this to be the Planck mass, but at this point, uh, this has no intrinsic scale, has no intrinsic meaning by itself, because in order to connect it to the Planck mass, you would have to compute something like uh, graviton scattering amplitude, just like you do in string theory. So this is the only parameter. So how is it related to the corresponding parameters in string theory? Well, for this, you have to do something called double dimensional reduction, where you identify one of the spatial membrane coordinates with one with a compactified uh, target space coordinates, coordinate. And then uh, in that reduction, uh, you get a nice relation, namely um, the membrane tension or gets multiplied by the radius of the compactified, the compactified direction. This is just this string uh, tension. And furthermore, one exploits this relation uh, where according to which the radius of the compactified coordinate is just the, essentially just the string coupling. And if you put everything together, you get a nice relation uh, saying that the, string, the membrane tension is essentially string tension times the um, string coupling to this power. This means that after reduction from d equals 11 to d equals 10 to embed the super string into the super membrane, you get a formula which ties together the two key parameters of uh, string theory. But remember that this is only makes sense after this double dimension reduction. Before you do it, you just have this, this parameter, which as I said, we choose to be dimensionless. Okay, now you just proceed in the canonical way by con um, computing canonical momenta. And uh, the formulas look quite simple, but if you substitute uh, what this is in terms of the original uh, target space coordinates, it's still quite complicated. Uh, so you have something for P plus, which is DL by uh, D, D zero X minus, and then for the fermion and this, is for the uh, transverse uh, membrane coordinates. Uh, there are nine of those because we're in 11 space-time dimensions. From the expressions for the uh, canonical momenta, you can read off the constraints. There's a first class constraint, which is just the spatial diffeomorphism constraint, which just assumes the usual form. This is completely analogous to string theory. And furthermore, there's the Hamiltonian density or light cone gauge density, which is essentially P0 minus. So P0 minus is the integral over this Hamiltonian density. And uh, the Hamiltonian density uh, just comes out to be this formula here. And so what you see here is that um, this is now something that looks a little bit more familiar because here you just have the usual P squared term. And here we have a kind of potential term which involves the determinant of the spatial metric G bar. 
and the whole thing is multiplied by p plus. And then we have uh, again the fermionic, uh, a fermionic piece. Now, one thing I would say here that you can see stability, instability. A stability requires positive membrane tension, which is in accord with expectations. You can see this by looking at this formula. That's one over p plus. This has T in it. So if you switch the sign of the membrane tension, this whole factor here becomes uh, negative and therefore unbounded from below. So for stability, we would like this to be positive. So once we have this Hamiltonian, the light cone Hamiltonian, then you can calculate the mass, quote unquote, operator. It's not an operator because we're still classical, uh, which is just the usual formula. You take out the zero mode and then you get this, this formula here. Um, so this formula is the P squared has the uh, zero modes taken out. There's also uh, no zero mode dependence in the rest of this uh, expression. And what you see here, it's again P squared plus potential with this factor T squared. And then you have again the fermionic uh, contribution. And this already starts looking a little bit like uh, young Mill's uh, theory. Um, so let's uh, try to further analyze this. But before I uh, continue, let, uh, there's a brief interlude because if you now fix, uh, if you fix the diffeomorphism gauge, um, there's a residual gauge invariance, which corresponds to, in string theory, there's still a residual gauge invariance, which is constant uh, translations along the uh, sigma one direction. This is here a little more complicated. The residual gauge invariance is an invariance with respect to spatial diffeomorphisms that uh, preserve the area, area preserving diffeomorphisms. And they're characterized by uh, divergence free vector fields. So that's this equation and on the membrane, you can locally solve this uh, in this particular way. Then we write the vector field as a curl, if you like, of a gradient. And if you substitute this in the standard formula for transformation of a scalar field, which is written here, uh, then you see that you can rewrite this um, transformation in terms of a bracket, which is, I call it APD bracket, bracket of two area preserving diffeomorphisms, which is defined in this way. This already appeared in the original work of Goldstone and Hopper of 1982. And uh, you can easily check that it satisfies all the properties of the Lie, of the Lie group, of Lie algebra. So uh, this is an infinite dimensional uh, Lie algebra, the infinite dimensional Lie algebra of area preserving diffeomorphisms on the membrane, which works for any genus of the, of the, of the membrane. In addition, there are also global diffeomorphisms, but uh, this is uh, not so important, well, mainly focus on the ones that are connected to the identity, which I denote as APD sub zero. Um, so this is a little bit like in string theory, when you take the quotient then you just get the um, mapping class group or a modular group. So now we want to, uh, so we now want to uh, rewrite this. As I, said, as I said, this is almost like Young Mills theory. So let's now proceed with this. So as I said, partial gauge fixing leaves this residual gauge invariance and the generator of this residual gauge invariance of error preserving diffeomorphisms has, has this form. And uh, you have to put this equal to zero in order to be able to solve these equations for the X minus coordinate. This is analogous to string theory, but in string theory, you don't have such uh, uh, a constraint, but here it's necessary because the formula is dr, dr and x minus equals to something, and then you have to impose an integrability constraint, which is essentially equivalent to imposing this constraint. Now, the, said the, 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 the main trick here, in order to really turn this into Young Mills like theory, <coughs> is uh, if you look at the potential here, we had the metric, uh, the determinant of the, of the spatial metric. Uh, so this is this is the potential basically, and this you can, you can rewrite as in Young Mills form as a as a square of this APD bracket. 
This is the elementary identity for determinants of two by two matrices. And this is what allows you to uh, rewrite the metric determinant in this funny way. And then once you've done that, you realize that the M squared formula can be equivalently obtained from the Lagrangian, which is this. And now you realize that this with this is essentially just uh, the Lagrangian of Young-Mills theory, but reduced to one uh, maximal Young-Mills theory, reduced to one uh, time dimension. Uh, so we also introduce, here introduce an omega uh, gauge field, which is really a zero. So this is, this is really the dimensional reduction of super Young-Mills theory from 10 dimensions to one dimension. And for the identification, you have to identify modulo of a constant factor, the membrane tension with the gauge coupling of this APD gauge theory. So that means that the small or large tension limit of the supermembrane is equivalent in this description to the weak or strong coupling limit of the APD gauge theory. Now it's still infinite dimensional gauge theory, but you can now approximate it by a finite dimensional gauge group by approximating the area preserving diffeomorphisms by SUN for n to infinity. This was one of the essential insights of, of this early work of uh, Goldstone and Hopper. What you do for this is you expand the, the membrane, uh, the target space coordinates as functions of the membrane spatial coordinates into a complete set of functions so for a sphere, this would just be the spherical harmonics. And then you truncate this sum at uh, n squared minus one. And uh, what you can then show, it's not completely obvious, so it requires some work that the, uh, sorry, that the um, structure constants of the APD gauge group, which are defined like this. So you see here's the bracket again, the APD bracket. Um, so you project this on again on the um, orthonormal basis, and then you can show that the structure constants of APD are or, obtainable as a limit of n to infinity of the SUN structure constants. This can be done for explicitly for the two sphere that was done in this early work, but. Uh, it's even easier to do for the two torus. Um, that's also, also was done in those days by several groups. Uh, in fact, uh, this statement is even true, has been shown to be true for uh, membranes of arbitrary genus, which is quite, quite an amazing result. So this is a sort of universal approximation that you can do for these, at least for the uh, uh, connected part, connected to the identity part of the Array preserving diffeomorphisms. And at that point, you end up with this matrix model Lagrangian, now for SUN, uh, which is just like here. And this is indeed, uh, this is indeed nothing but the reduction of uh, 10 dimensional super Young Mills theory to one di dimension. This is, I've now switched to a description where the spinners are SO9 spinners, the 16 component real. Uh, spinners and the matrices are now SO9 comma matrices. So if you supplement this with the SUN gauge constraint, which was previously the residual, the, the APD gauge constraint corresponding to the residual gauge symmetry um, in, this, in this gauge of, um, of the membrane, uh, this is the very same Lagrangian that much later was that underlies the M theory proposal of, um, of these people, which was uh, well, made in 96. Now, base, it's, it's the same model, it's the same mathematics. Uh, their picture is based on assuming that uh, um, D zero brains as the basic constituents of M theory. Of course, that's a different interpretation. However, what I would like to emphasize here is we're interested in the end to infinity limit. And if you can show that this limit exists in any sense, what you have is nothing but the supermembrane. So we're back to 1987. 
Now, the interpretation of this is a little more subtle because a supermembrane, and this is something we learned through these uh, developments, supermembrane is not a first quantizable one particle or n particle for any n theory, but a fully non perturbative description. Um, you know, in the beginning, we thought that supermembrane is like super string. You first first quantize, and then you get uh, then you get an infinite number of massive states. But instead, you get a continuum, so you couldn't quite make sense out of this. But the proper interpretation of this is that uh, this is not an n particle theory. You cannot first first quantize the supermembrane, but you have to right away go into the into the well. We call it second quantization, um, but uh, it's not it's not an n particle theory in any sense. Certainly not for n to infinity. This is actually explained uh, in in an old review I wrote with uh, Robert uh, Robert Helling back in ninety eight. So what kind of states do you get? You get the continuum, but you only get massless states. There's no such thing as massive excitations. Um, and these massless states correspond to the mass to the states of the massless 11 dimensional supergravity multiplet that is the um, yeah, graviton, gravitino, and the three form field. So, as I said, there are no massive excitations, but there's something more interesting that has not been worked out because it's technically extremely challenging. Because if you think about the membrane, the double. Uh, this double dimensional reduction corresponds to uh, th th the membrane degenerating into a needle, into a spike. Now, if you have a membrane, you can pull out uh, several needles or spikes from it. And at each of these spikes in this dimensional reduction, you get exactly the massive uh, uh, superstring spectrum. So, this means my way of interpreting it is that the supermembrane is not simply related to the super string by this, simply by this dimensional reduction. But what it really is or should be morally is something like a super a second quantized version of this of the super string. If you have several spikes, then it's like a multi-string uh, Fox space. As I said, this is technically so challenging. I've been thinking about it for a long time, but but to uh, to actually make this work and put some flesh on it seems to be extremely difficult. So we want to do a path integral quantization of this. For this, we have to set up the path integral. So here we go. So there are certain objects called the vertex operators on which you want to compute correlators. And this is the standard path integral formula. Uh, and because this is a gauge theory, the total action must contain a gauge fixing part. This is just the usual uh, Fadeev Popov uh, quantization procedure. So uh, one has to add to the um, matrix Lagrangian, one has to add uh, this piece, as is well known, uh, in particular containing these ghosts. These are now ghosts for the area preserving diffeomorphisms. In the Young Mills uh, approximation, they wouldn't have this label sigma, but they would have the a joint label of the SUN gauge group. Now, as Olaf will explain in his talk, we, we use a formulation where, where the fermions are integrated out. So, I mean, of course you can try to compute this directly, which again, something, something nobody has really done so far, but uh, you can also consider the question of what kind of functional measure is this or path integral measure is this? And uh, we use a formulation where the integral and where the fermions are integrated out. In particular, if you integrate out the target space uh, fermions, the thetas, then you get this uh, so called Matthew Salam Sila determinant, um, which is really Pfaffian because the integrating of a real fermions. And this is, this is what it is. And we have taken out a trivial factor of uh, d0 out of this determinant. So here we start out with a unit operator. And then there's a certain kernel, which looks as follows. Um, 
So the kernel is basically the young mills interaction to this target space coordinates. So this is at the end SUN approximation. And here, what appears here is the fermionic, the free fermion propagator in one dimension, which you see here. And it turns out to be just a step function. Of course, d by dt epsilon has to be delta. So that's what it is. It's also important that uh, we choose the uh, integration constant in such a way that uh, we have epsilon of t is minus epsilon of minus t. And then as we show in this paper, Olaf, in this paper with Olaf, uh, this is actually uh, for finite n, this is a well-defined uh, determinant provided these functions here L1 functions. It's what's called a Fredholm uh, determinant, uh, which is something which is true whenever this operator here is trace class. Um, so at that point, everything is completely well defined. Uh, but what happens in the limit uh, into infinity, one has to replace this kernel by something involving the infinite dimensional gauge group, the area specific diffeomorphisms. And this you can do by generalizing this kernel in this particular way, in such a way that you also integrate over these uh, sigma coordinates. Um, this, this you have to do because here the interactions involve the derivatives is a bit funny kind of system because the kinetic term only has uh, x dot uh, squared, but then it's the interaction that carry the uh, derivatives. So this is a bit unusual, but you can still try to evaluate the determinant in this n to infinity limit by means of the standard formula, log dead equals trace log. But then you see that there appear divergence factors involving uh, delta of zero. So that means like, uh, well, could be difficulty with taking the n to infinity limit, but this was actually to be expected because if you take the matrix model, you compute such things. And at the end of the day, you have to take the trace of SUN and then you get this extra factor of n. And therefore, uh, this, you get something that diverges in the limit n to infinity. Um, it simply means that the uh, cartan killing metric uh, is not, does not exist in this sense for the gauge group of APD, the APD gauge group. Now the crucial fact, and this is something I would like to emphasize here, is that for the supermembrane of finite n, this divergence is matched by a corresponding factor from the bosonic side. This will be explained in Olaf's uh, lecture. And this is actually the matching. This matching is actually what keeps the path integral measure well-defined in the limit n to infinity. And so one, there's hope that one can actually perform this limit. And one way to think about it is that this is a kind of proof, well, proof, evidence, that the supermembrane is actually renormalizable or maybe even finite theory. There's no such matching for the bosonic membrane. And in the old days, it used to be said that uh, bosonic membrane theory is non-renormalizable, except that uh, nobody has ever, you know, made a more concrete statement of what this really means. Now, here we see uh, what it, could mean, namely the fact that the n to infinity limit simply doesn't exist uh, for the bosonic model. So sorry to all those people who have been doing work on, on the matrix model, just the bosonic one. Uh, it doesn't look like this n to infinity limit exists. For this, you have to go supersymmetric. So final part of my talk, I will briefly touch upon the question what, uh, um, what would you like to compute? Now in string theory, what you do compute is expectation values of certain physical operators, vertex operators, there are lots of them, infinitely many. <clears throat> and the question is what are, are the analogs of these for the supermembrane? And actually there are, in 2000, uh, I wrote a paper with Jan Plefka and Arundhati Daskupta where we actually constructed these objects. Um, which are complicated because they have to very uh, satisfy various consistency conditions. 
uh, that are discussed at length in our paper. So this is, it's all explained there. I have no time to do this here. So in particular, they should reduce to the correct point particle limits for the 11 dimensional super point particle. As this was a paper by Green, Good, Perl, and Kwon back in 99. And more and equally important should upon double dimensional reduction reduce and factorize into the type two super string vertex operators. But this is a very non-trivial criterion. And just to tell you how, what it is, here's, here's one example. This is the transverse graviton um, vertex operator. When I say operator, it's always a pretension here because I'm not still not haven't been able to quantize this. It's just the classical analog of the vertex operator. So what you see here is a rather complicated expression, also involving these APD brackets. And uh, but you can see that this, if you look at this criterion, you can see that it's actually satisfied because in the double dimensional reduction, this part becomes x dot x dot. That's already nice to see, and. Furthermore, this quartic expression reduces simply to x prime times x prime. So you see that this piece in the double dimensional reduction does actually factorize into x dot plus x prime times x dot minus x prime, which is exactly what you want to have for, for type two superstrings. And well, for the rest, of course, it's harder to see. Uh, it's, it's much more tricky, but uh, I have to refer you to this paper. Also, just like in string theory, it's customary in string theory to set k plus equal to zero. Um, and this is simply done to avoid having to deal with the longitudinal uh, coordinate, string coordinate, membrane coordinate in the light cone gauge. Now, already in string theory, they do this, but here it's much more complicated. I flashed the expression for x minus a few slides ago. So, so uh, I have no time to explain all this in more detail, but there are also uh, vertex operators for longitudinal graviton polarizations for the gravitino and also for the three form photon of 11 dimensional supergravity. However, due to the complexity of these expressions and due to the complexity of the path integral, so far up to this point, it has not been able to do any kind of computation with this. However, what we're trying here is to sort of set up a formalism which allows you to, would allow, should allow you to, at some point to calculate something like a four graviton correlator, at least perturbatively, but now in a perturbative expansion in terms of this membrane tension, not, I mean, string, you have alpha prime, you have uh, a string coupling, but here you have just this one parameter and you would have to analyze or disentangle this, what it really implies in terms of uh, string theoretic expansions of these vertex operators. But this would provide a supermembrane, a hopefully calculable supermembrane analog of the Gerasopo Shapiro amplitude formula. Uh, as you know, in string theory, these, just like the Veneziano amplitude, is not the, the full story because there are corrections. Um, of all kinds. And uh, the, the thing about the membrane is, and this, make, I mean, it's one reason it's so hard to, um, hard to do, is if you can do this calculation, you've already captured, or you would cap be able to capture all kinds of non-perturbative um, corrections in string theory. Uh, in fact, maybe it's even some that are at the moment beyond uh, current string technology, but this remains to be explored. And once again, I said there are no uh, massive excitations, and this is mirrored in the fact if you, well, that's not the theorem, but a, a fact we've tried to do this and we failed, uh, that do not appear to exist analogs of massive superstring vertex operators. And no, unlike in string theory, where you can, for all the massive excitations, you can write down an associated vertex operator, there's no such thing, or well, there appears to be no such thing for the super memory. There are many further questions at this point, uh, which I just cannot go into, but um, it will be certainly be interesting to work this out to see how the 
to A theory and to B superstring theory embed into the quantum supermembrane because the important aspect of this, as I said, is somehow the supermembrane catches or uh, uh, yeah, uh, covers or, or encompasses uh, uh, corrections that in string theory uh, you don't get by just calculating uh, um, uh, tree level um, uh, correlators. So I'm finished. So uh, let me summarize. Um, I've taken you back to 1987 to the uh, supermembrane, um, which actually is a model beyond string theory. And there's only one theory that's not type 2A, type 2B, uh, heterotic, and so on. It's just a single and unique uh, theory. And I've tried to present arguments uh, showing that this is actually should, the good way to think about it is that. It's, it's really like a non-perturbative formulation of superstring theory. At least it contains non-perturbative aspects that are not there in the first quantized uh, string, superstring theory. We've presented arguments, or we have arguments that actually the n to infinity limit exists only for the supermembrane, not for the bosonic membrane thus somehow making more concrete the statement that the bosonic membrane is a non-renormalizable theory. And the main goal of this work is um, um, to develop new computational tools to make the quantum supermembrane more computationally accessible, in particular by, con uh, by concentrating on quantities for which uh, the APT expressions hence the n to infinity limits of the Young-Mills expressions remain well-defined. So uh, I would like to recommend uh, or advertise Olaf Lechtenfeld's talk later at uh, a different coffee workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Are there any questions, first of all, here in Corfu? George, please. Hi, Germain. I'm George Zupanos here. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems that uh, the IKKP people uh, have developed, uh, you know, uh, Monte Carlo methods to calculate things. Uh, and it seems to me that you have a similar problem. Could you go in this direction too? Uh, you mentioned the IKKT model, is this? Yes, because they claim the, the, the IKKT model is uh, Young Mills theory reduced to uh, zero dimensions. Okay. Uh, and there you're really dealing with an ordinary integral, not a path integral. And uh, but yes, yes, of course, it's conceivable that you might set up some kind of uh, numerical, um, well, like in lattice case theory, some, some. Um, you know, numerical uh, calculations to compute these correlators. But, you know, the difficulty is that the things you're actually interested in, namely correlators of these, of these um, vertex operators um, are very complicated. So you see here, if you want to calculate for graviton amplitude, you have to calculate the correlator for such uh, expressions that may not be easy to implement. Um, there are also other possible problems with a, with a, a fermionic measure, but uh, this is something that needs to be explored. By the way, I should also mention, there's also this matrix string theory, uh, which is uh, uh, essentially super young Mills theory reduced to one plus one dimension. And uh, for this, the methods that we develop may also um, apply. But yes, I, I think there, there are lots and lots of really challenging, interesting problems to do here, but uh, you need some more manpower to do this. You can't do it with just two people. Okay, uh, another question by the other George. Hi, Herman. Uh, hi. Before nice talk. Uh, I, George Savidi is talking. Yes, hi. 
Uh, I, I agree very much with what you say about bosonic membrane. And I want to comment is that when, when the, you consider in Jagnell's theory that Hoft limit, the trace of the generators, TA, TB, is normalized to one half. That's, and then you take N, equal N to infinity. Here, when you take the uh, goldstone Hoppy limit, you need the generators to the trace to diverge as n to the power three half. Yes. That's the reason why it is not renormalizable, unfortunately. Yes. Actually, at that point, I stopped working on the field. Yes. But, but what I want to understand, you claim that with the super membrane, this problem can be avoided and the theory is renormalizable. Their limit exists. Can you that's, explain why? That's... that's uh, that's um, um, yes. That's uh, that's. I mean, we have no full proof of this, but I'm, I'm just giving you indications. This divergence that we see in the fermionic determinant, um, which clearly blows up in this limit, uh, that can be cancelled or at least matched with with the corresponding part from the um, uh, from the bosonic side. Because as uh, Olaf will explain, is this we do by transforming the measure to a free measure, and then you get a functional determinant which ex exactly matches the uh, uh, the fermionic the determinant that you get by integrating out the, the fermions. Now this is a phenomenon that takes place only for the supersymmetric theory, but not but not for the bosonic theory. There you just left with this. Uh, with this divergence. And yes, maybe I should also say, there's also a question, maybe you should uh, take the limit in a different way, a la Toft. Um, that, uh, I, at the moment, I have nothing to say about this, but that's also something that one should keep in mind. Yes. But, uh, but I, I think, you know, there, there have been many indications over the years that the bosonic membrane is not renormalizable. And long, long, long ago, we tried to do this in the usual way, but just by setting up a continuum field theory calculation and trying to see whether there are uh, counter terms that you must, just like for gravity, introduce to make uh, things finite. But that calculation turned out to be too difficult. So. Okay, um, okay, maybe one very short last question from you because there is one more online. Hello, Herman. My name is Florat Emanuel. How are you? Yes, I know. I remember, I remember you and your work on, on the uh, area preserving diffeomorphisms. I didn't put all, in all the references, but that sadly it was an important contribution. Uh, I have just one short question. I mean, uh, as you said, the problem of nonlinearities of, su of supermembrane, um, which come also from the from the bosonic part, uh, um, uh, do not permit to have a usual perturbative expansion. There is no natural coupling constant, and most importantly, there is no kinetic term. Because you start with the derivatives with respect to sigma one, sigma yes. two, of power. Now, the functional determinant of the fermionic part, does it um, uh, help in this direction? I mean, do you create the quadratic part for the bosonic part in the in the expand, or do you create a coupling constant? How, how it happens? Well, that's... that's uh... That's that's the whole point about rewriting this uh, theory in this uh, young Mills like form because yes you're perfectly right if you just start with the original membrane action there's nothing like a free part and the interacting parts that can be separated in this way but what I wanted to show here or argue here is that once you rephrase it into in this young Mills language using uh, the old work of Goldstone and Hoppe um, then it then it's, you can cast it in this form. And the extra piece of information, which uh, we somehow in those days didn't put in, was to keep track of the membrane tension. 
because in those days we simply put the membrane tension equal to one, just forgetting about it. I've, I've put this parameter back in, and then you see that uh, after it's made dimensionless, you, it, it is essentially proportional to the uh, uh, Young-Mills coupling G. So there is a way to set, or that's the hope at least with these developments, that there's a way to set up a perturbative expansion, which is really like a, an expansion in, in, in the string tension. And I find this remarkable also in view of the fact that if you look at what people have said or done about the small tension limit of string theory, it's a bit murky. Here it's very clear cut because it gets related to weak and strong coupling expansion of young mills theory. So indeed, there's only one parameter in strings in, in membranes here, it's a membrane tension. And this is a scheme whereby we try to enable ourselves to set up a perturbative expansion in this one parameter that strings, uh, the membrane theory has. Okay, finally, there's one online question, although it's already very late. Uh, yes. Hi, Herman. It's, uh, it's Kelly here. Hi, Kelly. Hi. I have also a question about renormalization. Um, from from the, the bosonic membrane, we and you can anticipate, and I guess this is what you've already looked at, that the, uh, the renormalization problem is going to be similar to gravity. Yes. In, the, in higher and higher loops, you'll develop higher and higher counter terms and uh, that's, but supersymmetry, of course, can alleviate that problem by causing cancellations. But as with uh, maximal supergravity, it looks like eventually the, the magic of supersymmetry runs out at some order. For su four-dimensional supergravity, maximal will be seven loops, etc. So I'm worried that you've discussed um, uh, the cancellation of a leading di divergence by supersymmetry, but there may be higher order ones that are eventually going to bite you. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, um, but you should keep in mind that this is not just, uh, it's, it's a very different kind of uh, divergence we're talking about here than the ones that we know from uh, supergravity. Um, yes, of course, uh, one has to investigate uh, what happens now if you try to set up uh, correlators and such things with this formalism. Um, but the other thing is, of course, we're not talking about 11 dimensional supergravity here on maximal supergravity. We're talking about the, the theory that sits on top of all this and sits even on top of uh, type two string theory. So uh, it's, it's an entirely different question. Of course. My, my question but, was based on in, the, in, in, in three dimensions, the three dimensional membrane still has a structure uh, somewhat similar to supergravity in this that it, it's by power counting non renormalizable. And yes. then so you have to see what kinds of counter terms are going to come up, come up for you. Yes. And eventually you'll yes. have higher, higher order counter terms that uh, you no, have no, to. No, I, I, I know what you mean. <clears throat> I know what you mean. But I, I would say that the problem here is in a, in a is a different problem because the problem from the point of view of matrix theory, the problem yeah. really, is there any way to uh, make the limit n to infinity well-defined? Yes. It, this is this is what's proposed to be a model of M theory. And of course, if it's non-renormalizable, then uh, too bad, but then that's it for matrix theory. And, um, but I would hope that, uh, that there are, the, there are certain properties in the theory that actually make this work, also because it's it's really a different uh, kind of uh, limit that we're looking at. We're not looking at order by order countertops, but uh, it's really the question whether you can make sense of the theory right away as an APD gauge theory. This is the way it's been set up here, and the the idea is or the hope is that we can really just take this. APD gauge theory as is and try to make sense out of it and try to make sense out of the out of the correlators. So it's a different, it's not it's not the same as calculating counter terms in, in supergravity. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Nice talk anyway. Thank you. So let's think again. Herman, please nice talk. Yeah, thank you.
And I had suggested we reconvene in 15 minutes at 11.45 sharp. So goodbye.